What I wanted to do was to just touch on what's happening in computer science, uh, little bits and pieces to give you a sense for how exciting it can be uh, in this, uh, this time, even though computers have been around for a while. Uh, the uh, Association for Computer Machinery started in 1947. Some of the earliest computers were available in 1938 by Conrad Zuse. And of course, uh, Babbage was building uh, calculating engines uh, as far back as uh, the middle uh, of the 19th century. But we are now reaching a point uh, where computing uh, has uh, exceeded the capacity and capability of anything that could have been imagined uh, even uh, 40 years ago. So I'm going to, uh, what does this say? It wants me to log in again. Um, what I want to give you a sense for is what is possible as a consequence of the scale at which we can do computing today. We're, we're achieving certain things that simply couldn't be done before because we didn't have enough capacity to compute. We didn't have enough memory to hold information. We didn't have the ability to manipulate it literally in real time. So I'm going to start out by showing you a little video uh, from uh, CBS. Uh, this is a person who uh, was um, experiencing the, the Google self-driving automobile. And it can only accomplish this task because it's able to ingest huge amounts of information. Right now we are in Google's self-driving car with the man himself who started it all. Okay. And, and take so, my seat belt. Yes, yeah, so I should put on my seat belt as please well probably. Ahead. Okay, okay. here. Um, so tell, tell people exactly what inspired you to create this. Oh, it's just the most fun thing in the world to do, to, to make cars drive themselves. I mean, you need them, people want them. It's just great. It also has a lot of societal benefits. Um, I mean, lots of people have accidents. We can make cars safer and we can make driving much more convenient. And what are the mechanics around this technically? How do you make something like this well, work? Well, there's a hardware component to it. You have to snip into the car and, 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 and get the signals to control the steering and the brake. <laughs> These are radar sensors. They work just the way your adaptive cruise control works. Oh, yeah. So when you buy an adaptive cruise control, the high-end cars, Lexus or Mercedes, you get those and they keep the distance to the car in front of you at a fixed range. This is essentially a, a camera, where it's a special camera that measures how, how far things are away. And the reason why it spins is it does it every single direction. So you're being imaged by the sensor right now. And, and where's the video with that? How, what's that coming from? Uh, the, the sensor feeds into the display. So what you see in the display is the car's own perception of the environment. Mm -hmm. So you see all the obstacles and so on. And the car uses those to avoid them. But the big thing is, is uh, AI. It's artificial intelligence. It's advanced software. It's machine learning. It's making the car really smart. That smart where it can drive itself. So, but you use Google Maps. Like, how does the car know when to stop, when to go, when to, you know, go around something? Well, as a Google car, it's a cloud computing car, so it has a lot of data in the cloud. So we drive everything that the car drives first manually, and then we record enormous amounts of data about the environment, and then we use this data to aid the car. So, for example. We know in advance where every stop sign is, where every traffic light is. And that's from Google Maps, you know yeah. where everything yeah. is. Yes, and that's actually very easy to do. And what if things change? Everything's changed, we drive again, and the car can detect certain changes, and certain changes it can't detect right now, and we're still working on it. And, and what are you hoping to do with all of this? Well, eventually, I think this is a science project, obviously, but eventually, I believe it should really change the driving experience. Like, for example, you should be able to drive safely and work at the same time or text at the same time. <laughs> people who can't drive today, we're going to talk today about blind people, yeah. aging people should be able to drive. It should make part driving more convenient and, and, and safer. What cities does this work in right now? Right now it's in the Bay Area and it's the major freeway system. And so how long will it take for us to see this implemented uh, with consumers? It's very hard to say because this is really run like a research project. So we have a number of open problems. The technology isn't there yet. We still have to improve it, it turns out. And then we have to think about what the right products will be. All right. Well, hopefully it works today because we are about to get a drive. So let's go. Uh, and, go. and so what is this right now? Uh, this is a correlation of the data that the car is seeing that's coming in. The, the, it's uh, detecting the 3D structure of the world. So, okay. And this is how it knows what to go around. and. Okay. okay. Can I uh, hmm. get you to hold the keyboard, Spencer? Sure. Okay. There's a keyboard. Open? What does the keyboard do? Keyboard is the start button. Okay. <laughs> no hands. Okay. I'm this keep my hands close the steering wheel just in case and foot the brake. Right. Oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> and, and how fast are we going right now? Uh, <laughs> 30 miles an hour. 30 
and he has no hands. <laughs> and we're going around a lot of different things. <laughs> so I should say, you don't drive that fast in traffic. This is meant to be a fun ride on a closed parking garage. Oh my god. <laughs> Oh my god, look at that, we're going around a lot of stuff. Where's the speedometer? Oh my god. Oh my god. Holy my god. We're going around a lot right now. Alright, that is so cool. Oh my god. A lot of twists and turns here. So it turns out computers are really capable when it comes to driving, and people underestimate what a computer can do. Now we know you about this. Yes. This is the finish line. The finish line, okay. I just took a few I'm going to manually turn this back. Okay. Okay, I'm going to stop that there. Now, a couple of observations to make. First of all, they were on top of a building. Okay, if that car had gone over the, you know, this was a scary thing. And it was up to 40 miles an hour on top of that building. Uh, and Sebastian, who was the guy that uh, designed this originally, seemed very calm in the back seat. Uh, he was the guy that led the team at Stanford University that met the first DARPA challenge to get a car to drive itself. So this was a defense department project initially. The first time they did it, all the contestants managed to get their cars to go about seven miles. And then you know, they all kind of ran off the track or didn't work anymore. The second year, five or six of them managed to go about 127 kilometers. And Stanford University won that particular round, and Sebastian now works at Google. Uh, he has cars which have driven a total of 140,000 miles in San Francisco without drivers. Now, there are people in the cars because legally we can't let these things loose. Uh, but, <laughs> but, we, uh, but we've actually applied now to the state of Arizona for permission to allow these cars to be on the roads. And uh, we'd also like to have uh, Congress or somebody pass a law saying that if it's a, a Google self-driven car, it's okay to text while the car is being driven, because that's the whole idea. Now, just to tell you how uh, one VP of R&D at General Motors reacted, uh, I had uh, come into a meeting with him, and there had been an announcement that we would uh, clocked 140,000 miles uh, in San Francisco. And he sat down and he said, this is absolutely wonderful because it's the only way we will ever have safe driving. Human beings are increasingly distracted in the car. We, we keep giving them more and more things to do other than driving. And so his conclusion was the only way we will ever have safety on the roads is to stop people from driving and let the cars do it themselves. So that's, uh, you can just imagine the amount of computation that, uh, that has to be done to achieve that. Uh, the other thing which I wanted to emphasize is that we have sufficient computing power now to emulate or simulate things at extremely high resolution that we could never do before. And I have another example of that. It's not uh, specifically a Google example. Um, oh, let's see if I can find it here. Here we are. Uh, this is an example of a simulation of a galaxy forming. Now, in order to do this kind of thing, you need large amounts of computing power, large amounts of memory, lots of uh, random access memory, uh, in order to perform the computation. So let's just watch. So we're watching a galaxy uh, uh, forming out of simply um, a mass of gas, slowly evolving. The amount of computation that's needed in order to see this sort of thing in real time is frankly stunning. Now, you can see in the lower right-hand uh, uh, part there, the changing numbers are the number of billions of years that this is simulating. So it's clearly allowing many billions of years to happen in a short period of time. Otherwise, you couldn't see this amount of dynamics. But it's completely fascinating to see how similar this looks to some of the images that we see uh, when we're staring out into space. Of course, we don't get to see it at this rate. So this is giving us, the other thing I want to emphasize about this is our computational powers are allowing us to observe phenomena which we would not normally be able to see because they don't happen fast enough. And so this way we begin to see some of the dynamics of star formation or galaxy formation. There's another important element that uh, I want to emphasize here and that's our ability to use probability in order to understand what's going on. There was a theorem that was uh, put together by a man named Bayes, who called the Bayesian uh, probability theory. And the whole point of this notion was that you could uh, assign a set of probabilities to some phenomena, 
and then actually measure something about that phenomenon and use the measurement to feed back into the probability estimate, estimates. This Bayesian analysis, this sort of post hoc analysis, allows for learning. And it's become a very, very important part of many artificial intelligence activities that, uh, that we engage in and others do at Google. The driving system learns from its experiences using some of the Bayesian analysis. Something else that we've done, which I'd like to show you, uh, involves the use of um, processing of large quantities of, uh, of information in order to do a good job of translating languages. Uh, what Google has achieved, which others thought could be done easily and, and didn't succeed about 40 years ago, is to actually uh, translate languages, up to 50 of them, uh, one language to the other. So uh, I remember being at Stanford University in the 1960s when it was thought that all you needed to do was put the dictionary into the computer and then it would translate from one language to another. And so we tried Russian and English. And uh, the, the story goes that uh, we took an English language expression out of sight, out of mind, and translated it into Russian, and then translated it back into English, and it came out invisible idiot. <laughs> uh, thought, okay, maybe there's something lost in the translation. So for several decades, that was the sort of the state of, uh, of translation. Uh, but Google has reached the point now because it has such a vast quantity of samples of English and German and French and Russian and so on of the same thing that we can now use probabilistic methods to do the trans translations. These happen in real time and I'm going to show you a real time translation uh, right now. Here is a Russian uh, copy of, in Russian of Pravda and I'm going to ask the system to translate it into English in real time and to lay out the web page exactly the same way uh, that it looks now. So I will ask it to translate. Okay, so what you're seeing is the same page, same web page that was written in Russian translated into English. Now I'm sure if you happen to speak Russian and you look at the translation you would find places where it is not perfect. But it's quite stunning to see how many different language pairs the Google system is capable of operating. This is freely available to anyone. If you go on the, uh, uh, on the net and you go to translate.google.com, uh, you can bring up any text that you want, point it to any URL, and ask it to translate for you. And it will do, as, you know, uh, it will do well or poorly, depending on which language pairs you pick. Uh, I don't uh, speak uh, Norwegian and Mongolian, but I'm pretty sure if I tried to translate one into the other, we probably would not do as well for lack of samples of, two, of multiple documents in the two languages compared to English and, uh, and other languages. But this is another example of the amount of computing power that we have available uh, today, not just Google, but, uh, but uh, all, many of us, in order to car carry out these kinds of uh, 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 computations. I wanted to pick up another example here. This one uh, is an example of how you can take huge quantities of what would otherwise be very boring information, uh, statistical information which you would typically see in a book page after page after page of tables. And they're just static things. When you get enough compute power around, you can begin to render that information in various ways. Now the Gapminder software uh, was acquired by Google uh, from a Swedish uh, scientist and his idea was to take this rather boring collections of data and present them in ways that would allow you to get more insight. There's a famous man, uh, Richard Hamming, yes, thank you. Okay, so Richard Hamming was saying that the purpose of measurement is not numbers, it's insight. And a good deal of what uh, Rosling did, Hans Rosling did with this technology is exactly that you can present up to five different things about the data at the same time on one chart. You can present a, an x-axis and a y-axis. You could present a, a scatter diagram. The color could mean one thing. The size could mean another thing. Uh, then you get two other uh, values based on the um, x and y axes. And then if you animate it, you get time. So you get five different possible things. So here's an example of a plot that has been animated of income 
versus uh, life expectancy. Now you could imagine the tables in a book looking like this and not giving you very much insight into what's going on. Each one of the circles is a different country. Okay, so let me play this one first. You can see the, the years being presented in the background. And uh, I will play this one more time, but I will, I, I will highlight a few countries to pick on so that you get a real sense for who is competing with whom and so on. But here you're just, you can see that over a period of time that some countries' lifespans, the, the citizens of, the, of those countries have had increasing lifespans over time. Not surprisingly, uh, the colors here right now are uh, keyed to continental uh, elements. So yellow, uh, for example, is North and South America, and you can see that uh, if we go over here, that's the United States. And so now let me go over here and select a few um, particular countries uh, to, uh, to highlight. Let me pick up China. Where's China? Here's China. Let's get um, about Russia. Oh, missed it. There we are, Russia, let's get the United States. There. And now let's play these again and let's watch those three countries. You see the US is uh, still only at, at 40, uh, 40 years on average for quite some time until in the um, late 1800s, suddenly it takes off. This, the U.S. economy and, uh, and our uh, quality of life dramatically increased compared to every other country in the world. Now, the, uh, remember the dots are <clears throat> population size, so this is China. Oh, I'm, yes, that, right, this big thing is China. And uh, this, this one over here, I think, is Russia. So where we end up is that uh, Russia, China, and the US all have ended up with much higher uh, lifetimes over the period of uh, uh, 200 years, approximately. The idea that you can uh, see this kind of data in real time and change what's being presented in real time, you can literally explore the database. So to give you an example, we have another database that has 360 terabytes of performance information about the internet itself. Looking at the edges of the net, seeing how much data people can send in, how quickly the data moves, what the round trip time are, times are and everything else. 360 terabytes of data can be explored using tools like this. And so we've encouraged people who are interested in the way in which networks perform, internet in particular, to take advantage of using these tools just to explore displaying all the various pieces of data in order to appreciate what might be going on, maybe to discover patterns that you wouldn't otherwise recognize when the data is seen in, in a static form. So those are uh, several specific examples of, uh, of what's going on. I just want to mention a few other uh, things that are at the cutting edge of, uh, of computing today. One of them uh, has to do with the general notion of open source. For many years, software had been a proprietary thing. You wrote the software, you protected it as, as uh, uh, proprietary information, typically trade secrets. And then there was a period of time when <clears throat> software patents were permitted. I happen to be somewhat opposed to that, but setting that aside, it's still evidence of an attempt to hold on to and to hide and keep uh, secret the software that you've developed. But over the last couple of decades, especially the last 10 years, there's been a massive increase in the amount of open source software, that is to say software whose source is made available to everyone. Google believes very strongly in this particular paradigm. We've released uh, source code for a Chrome, a Chrome browser uh, for our Android operating system. What happened? This thing went to sleep. Um, to the, uh, the Android operating system, which has become a very popular platform for mobiles, uh, and soon we will release Chrome OS. Linux is another example of a software package that's based on Unix, but which is also released in uh, source form. So what I, I want to emphasize here is that the rate at which you can evolve 
software is dramatically increased if you allow everyone to see the software, everyone to make changes to it, everyone to look for problems, um, holes, security flaws, and things like that. And so that uh, change, dramatic change in the computer world, I think is going to accelerate the rate at which we discover new kinds of applications and other people can contribute uh, to their implementation. So that's one thing. The second thing uh, that's uh, cutting edge is that uh, the internet is running out of address space. Um, the this, this standard that was established in 1978 allowed for what's called a 32-bit address. That's 4.3 billion possible addresses. And that number was chosen in 1973. Uh, that was at the very, very beginning of the internet uh, project. And I stuck with that number when I was in the Defense Department in 1977 when the question came up, how much address space do we really need for this? And there were a lot of arguments. And I said, look, 4.3 billion terminations is enough for an experiment. And I thought this was an experiment, and I thought that if it worked, what we would do is, you know, implement a production version. Well, the experiment never ended. So here we are in 2011. We're running out of experimental address space. There's a new address space, which was standardized in 1996. It's called IP version 6. It has 128 bits of address space. This uh, accounts for 3.4 times 10 to the 38th addresses which is the number either only the Congress or an astrophysicist could appreciate. Um, and I'm hoping it'll last until after I'm dead, then it'll be somebody else's problem. On June 8th, uh, literally just less than a month from now, uh, many of us who are involved in the internet business are going to turn on the IPv6 address uh, system on the internet in, while in parallel with IPv4. So we're not shutting off IPv4. The internet is not going to crash and suddenly stop working. But what we want to do is allow it to expand uh, much more than it has now. And so IP version 6 is the next big thing. The two other next big things are that because we have this large address space, and because uh, computing equipment and software and everything else has become cheaper and cheaper to make and deploy, uh, we're beginning to see emerging an Internet of Things. We're starting to see all kinds of appliances become part of the Internet environment, whether it's sensor networks or picture frames that are Internet enabled or uh, kitchen appliances or office appliances or things we carry around with us or things that are in the car. These are all becoming part of an, of an Internet um, of things. And I think that's going to transform uh, our living uh, conditions pretty dramatically, especially if we get feedback about our energy use that we don't get today. We get our bills at the end of the month. You use this many kilowatt hours, but you don't know what it was you did to consume that. Now you'll have more detailed information that will tell you something about how your lifestyle decisions translate into consumption of power, for example, or other uh, resources like oil and water and so forth. Uh, the last thing I wanted to mention, which I always like to bring up, is that the Internet is no longer confined to operate on planet Earth. For the last uh, dozen years, I've worked with the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and with other uh, of the NASA laboratories to design and build an extension, interplanetary extension of the Internet. Now, every time I say this, some people say, okay, this is, it's a joke, and uh, you know, Vince is hoping the Martians will show up or something. That's really not the motivation. What I'm interested in is establishing standards for communication for spacecraft, no matter what country they're built by, so that over time, these spacecraft that have been sent off to particular missions, when they finish, their primary mission can be repurposed as nodes of the communication network. The reason I want that is that we can foresee a time when there will be fairly complex environments for space exploration. We already have a fairly interesting environment on Mars. We have the two rovers, one of which is stuck in the sand, the other one's still moving around. We have four orbiters around Mars. We have orbiters that are around Saturn and so on. Uh, we have many other spacecraft that are in a halo around Earth. There's one uh, which is called Epoxy, which just visited um, the Hartley 2 comet back in November of last year, and it's on its way back uh, towards Earth now. It's in a very eccentric orbit around the sun. It has already been outfitted with the interplanetary protocols, and we've been testing with it. The space station has the protocols on board as well, and we've been testing with that. So what I'm hoping will happen over the course of this decade is that the Consultative Committee on Space Data Systems, which standardizes space communication protocols, will adopt these protocols. 
The reason it's important is that up until now, all of the space exploration has been supported with point-to-point -point radio links. This is a pretty wimpy network. Yeah, what I'm interested in is, is something that really is a network, and that's what we've got on Mars today. The rovers are actually transmitting data up to the orbiters in packet form, the same way the Internet works, uh, and, it, and that data is being held in the orbiter until it gets to the right place in its uh, orbit to transmit data back to Earth at 128 kilobits a second. So we have this really tiny little point, you know, two-hop network, but it's delivering 99% of all the data that's coming back from Mars. When the Phoenix lander landed on Mars in May of 2008, there was no configuration of that system that had a direct path back to Earth, and so they had to use the store and forward method in order to deliver data from the um, Phoenix lander. So I'm very excited about the possibility that over the next several decades, we'll literally grow an interplanetary backbone and use it both to support manned and robotic exploration. Well, I'll stop there. I can tell you there's more to be said about all of the subjects that we've talked about. Uh, but that's the whole idea, is give you a teaser and hope that some of you will pursue these ideas. Thank you very much.